This is a snippet of my introduction to Nginx uh, Udemy course, uh, discussing in detail the internal architecture of Nginx. So in this lecture, I talk about uh, how Nginx, how many processes does Nginx uh, uh, spin up, how these processes accept connections, how they are competing for precious CPU cores, and many, many other things. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, if you want to check out the course, head to nginx.hosseinnasser.com. This will redirect to uh, Udemy with the latest uh, uh, discount coupon. It supports the show. Thank you so much. What's going on, guys? In this lecture, I want to go through the internal architecture of Nginx. So this uh, lecture is going to be slightly different. We're going to go deep into Nginx, how the worker processes are spun up, how the connection management is done, and uh, uh, stuff like that. Exactly understanding how Nginx deal with these large number of connections uh, based on the number of CPU core cores that you have on your server. Uh, Excuse my voice, I have a little bit of a sore throat uh, fighting it. But uh, let's get into it. So uh, this is not entirely, uh, I try to simplify this, uh, the architecture. The Nginx architecture starts with something called the master process. When you spin up Nginx, it starts a process that corresponds to the rest of all the processes of Nginx. Right. Yeah. There are two things that I didn't mention here related to the cache management of Nginx. So when you spin up Nginx, it spins up a process or two processes to manage the cache. That means reading the cache from disk and uh, also refreshing these caches. But this is, I thought this is not really what um, what is more important. What is the most important thing is actually what we call the worker processes. Or the child processes so this is these are the processes that actually do more most of the work you know and when you set nginx to auto mode which is the default right what will happen is uh n number of processes worker processes will be spun up based on how many hardware threads do you have you know and uh, this is the hardware speaking basically when you have like uh, a processor it has multiple cores let's say you have four cores on your cpu right? and usually at the hardware level intel amd or uh, apple sometimes does time slicing where even the core itself they split it into something called the hardware threads where they present the cpu to the process to the application to the operating system as actual multiple uh, cores so each core becomes two hardware threads right because they they can do at that level they will simulate almost uh, in this particular case eight cores right so that's why in if you have four cores you're gonna have eight worker processes if you have uh, uh, eight physical cores you're gonna have uh what 16 and so on right but for simplicity let's ha let's say you have uh, four hardware threads so that's what two cores or sometimes even uh, it doesn't have to be like this this duality right one cpu core can have one hardware thread if you disabled what is it called? Hyper threading, I believe. If you disable hyper threading, you can have one to one, right? And this is a choice you make based on performance and stuff like that. So we have now four worker processes, and the kernel sits right behind all of this stuff. You know? So if I have a client, this is presented by this laptop, want to connect to Nginx, let's say on port 80, that's where Nginx is listening, I'm hiding so many complexity behind this stuff here but what's happening is when the client establishes a tcp connection which is the sensen ACK, ACK, the sin request will go through the kernel and the kernel will put it in something called the sin queue and uh, and that is kind of managed by the kernel but it was allocated by nginx when it says hey kernel i'm listening on port 80 please anything that comes on port 80 please send it to me and when that happens the kernel will reply back with the uh, SYNAC, basically, to complete the TCP handshake. And then the client will reply back by an ACK, completing the three-way handshake. And when that happens, the kernel will move that fully-fledged connection 
to something called the accept queue. Right? And again, I'm not showing any of that stuff just to simplify the picture here, right? And then in that queue, so, so there are two queues, the send queue and the accept queue. And when that connection queue, the accept queue happens, right? And again, it's in the kernel. The Nginx is responsible to get the connection from the accept queue. It says, hey, I want this connection back. And this is where you need basically, uh, you know, hours and hours to discuss this stuff you know how does nginx how does the process picks up a connection from this connection queue is an art by itself there are so many methods there are so many discussions there are so many papers written about this particular problem right how do i accept as uh, connections as fast as possible you know so many uh, stuff uh, here uh, and i think it's like a little bit out of, out of the scope of this you know introductory course I might uh, create another course to discuss this in detail if you want. So um, what happened here, eventually, one of the worker processes will pick up this connection and that connection will live in the worker process itself, you know, as a pointer, if you will. It's a, it's a file descriptor. We call it an integer value pointed to that connection. And the worker now is responsible to read data from this connection. Again, how this connection is picked up by what worker process is is a completely different story. There is load balancing involved at the kernel level, right? There are sometimes all the worker processes listen on the same port and, and, and the kernel actually distribute the connection between uh, uh, between other worker processes. Sometimes the, wo the worker processes actually, uh, the, the master worker processes is what is delivered the connection and it will distribute the connection based on that but regardless we have a worker picked up a connection now it's ready to read stuff right and it's actually consumed the request so when you send a request you consume it you understand it's a request whether layer 7 or layer 4 we talked about all that stuff right and then we'll take that stuff and then it will decide what to do what can it do when a, when a request they actually sent and now we have clients sending Right, so we have the client that's established a connection to worker four. This client established a connection to worker three, and it started sending a request, right? The actual HTTP request, for example. That request will go through the kernel, obviously. It will go through the TCP connection that we talked about. All of this data will live in that uh, queue, right? In in a specific buffer. And, and I talk about all of that. And if you're interested to know more, check out my networking course. I talk about details like these buffers and the window sizes and all that nitty-gritty detail about tcp the worker process will read this request because it has to actively read it it's not a push model the kernel never pushes stuff to to the process it's not like hey i have data here you are no it's a pull model if you will yeah and this is again there is eventing involved there is asynchronous io involved there is this new thing that's called io ring which which effectively uh, create a complete let, let the kernel does the reading and it will uh, notify the worker process hey i have i have data for you and listen that i said i have data for you i never said you i have a request for you right there's a big big difference between a request and just a stream of bytes you got to understand that. That's where layer 7 and layer 4 comes into the picture. And here we're talking about layer 7, right? We need to terminate the data. If there is TLS, there isn't in this case, right? We're going to terminate it and decrypt it, understand it, and then take that data, understand that this is the start of the request, this is the end of the request. Because when you look at layer 4, the stream of data is just a stream of bytes, just garbage. The application nginx in this case needs to read 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 oh there's a start of request that is the end of the request it needs to understand how to parse http headers and this differs from http 11 versus http 2 versus http 3 right http 3 is a completely different protocol it's a quick but the cost of this parsing it lives right here so that's cpu right so each worker process is pinned to a cpu and we never talk about why why we have one worker per cpu because 
we really need that worker process to live in a in a core and never leaves it as fast as possible never leave that cpu core why because there's something called context switches and if you how does i know i'm going to go over the previous but this is all related you know if this worker tried to parse this request to understand how it actually and uh, how it needs to respond to it it needs to parse it this parsing before that it needs to actually decrypt it and this is where cryptography comes into the picture so it needs to use whatever symmetric key encryption it used to decrypt that content and then parse that uh, find where the request actually is all of this requires cpu right and when you, you do this operation the sets of instructions that you have this parsing logic is a basically it's just a set of instructions and it lives in the cpu core and then the cpu will just picks one instruction at a time and and, it, and keeps uh, you know executing it if you have a lot of processes and a lot of threads then the cpu might kick you out you know put you somewhere else in back in memory and then put some other process to execute its thread that is called context switching you switch the cpu off to do something else and you are put on hold as a process that is expensive and it's not really expensive if you if you're doing it one or twice or three or ten or hundred times but if you're doing it millions and millions of times especially if you have a lot of threads and you're they are competing for these cores then it becomes a problem, right? That's why we have one-to-one -one mapping here so that uh, the, as long as you don't have anything else but Nginx running on your machine, right? That's the goal here. We have to have one process, you know, pinned, right? With that said, now that we know this stuff, we have a request. Worker 3 got a request, right? Worker 4 got a request. It has options. What can it do? Well, some request might be to the web server, aspects of nginx hey go and read the content from disk and that is that particular request is an io bound we call it io bound right technically the request parsing itself and decryption was cpu bound but it's not as much you know unless you have many many requests coming in from that connection then you start feeling it but there is certain logic in this case is io bound that means hey i'm sending that request to the disk to read this uh file this html page the css file and then i'm going to respond back to the user during that reading i spend i don't know 10 milliseconds i'm waiting i'm not doing anything because nginx does always eventing it, it has an event right where it will send the io request and we'll just sit down and do the see the process can do some something else right and this technically goes through the kernel as well you know i just didn't draw it because the io is a kernel call right alternatively you can query something from a back end right where hey go and uh, i don't know you're just doing a microservices right where uh, this is a reverse proxy in this particular case where this is terminating the thing go and make the request on the actual back end that's also an io request right it's just that other than the network instead of going to disk and you get back the response and then you write back the response and the writing of the response is also you know the cost of writing to the socket right and the cost of re-encrypting right the content again this part of the case is not there is no encryption but most cases you will encrypt right because tls will be enabled right and the cost of building the http response all of the cpu intensive stuff and then encrypting it and then sending it back to the client so that's basically how nginx worked behind the scenes and now uh, you can just multiply that by many many other users right many users connect they will be load balanced ac across these four workers in this particular case so you can have thousands and thousands of connection per worker so one worker might have i don't know 120 200 300 connections so it will just flip between connections and to do multiple work yeah so go like, oh, someone just sent me a request here let me parse it someone just sent me a request here let me parse it so you can see that the nginx is doing so much work you know to actually parse these requests so cpu you know finding out the limit here 
to your CPU and finding out how many processes do you need to spin up, you know, and how what other stuff is running on your Nginx is really critical. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. Gonna see you in the next one. Enjoy the course.